Good morning. Whether you are with us in the sanctuary or whether you are listening or watching from home, you are welcome here at St. John United Church of Christ. There are many announcements. I'm just going to highlight some of them. The order for Easter flowers is next Sunday. And remember, those are used to adorn the sanctuary area. OK. My crib sheet's wrong. <laughs> They're due today, sorry. Uh, Monday, Monday, Thursday, and Easter breakfast, there are sign-up sheets back there so that we know how many are coming so that we can plan accordingly. And especially for Monday, Thursday, if you're willing to make stew, that's our usual Monday, Thursday meal, uh, please sign up that you're willing to do that. We had a thank you from David and Mary and Plant. They extended their thanks for the reception for their ordination anniversary, which was held last week. Women's Fellowship will meet this Thursday. Deanna has something special planned. And we're also going to look at some of the old photos from maybe 40 years back. <laughs> so some of you will get to relive some of those memories. Uh, this Monday, tomorrow, at the First Presbyterian Church, there is a Bible study for women. And then the last announcement that I have is following worship today, there'll be a petition drive here. And uh, it's for citizens, not politicians. And I think it has to do with gerrymandering. So if you have not signed a petition and you believe that our current lines are incorrect, then please do sign that. Also, I think they will have um, people here to register for voting, too. So if you haven't registered and wish to do so, they will be able to do that. Are there any other announcements? Just a reminder, didn't make it in the bulletin, but April the 7th is our farewell luncheon um, for the pastor and his wife, and we would encourage you to put that on your calendar so that you can come and join us. The meat is provided and everything else is whatever you want to bring. And also, we need um, at least one more person, maybe two, for the search committee. And so just contact me if you're interested in doing that. If you couldn't hear Jan, she said for Monday, Thursday, if you're willing to make stew, all the elements, all the groceries are provided. She'll have them ready the Sunday before, so you just pick up your packet and throw it in the pot and make the stew and bring it Thursday night. Are there any other announcements? No matter who you are or where you are on your spiritual journey, you all are welcome here at St. John United Church of Christ.
Please stand in body and or in spirit as we join together and center our hearts for worship. Holy One, like Lazarus, we wait for rebirth, for the brightness of life and death. We come to worship, we follow Jesus to the brink of death, and watch in awe for the signs of new life. We, like Lazarus, are born, renewed, ready for action. Are you... join together as we call upon God. Holy One, if you hold our sins against us, who could live? Who could stand? We seem to have more faith in death than hope in your promise of life. We seek peace through war and find security in weapons. We abandon the hungry, sick, and dying. And even so, you love us. Still, there is forgiveness with you. Therefore, we worship you, for you alone, O God, can save us from death and redeem us from our sin. O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. If Jesus Christ dwells in you, The Spirit of God will be your life, and the grace of God will be your righteousness. And if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, then God, who raised Jesus from the dead, will also give life to your mortal bodies. Friends, this is the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
Well, no, normally this would be the time when I would uh, do a little message preview so you would hear what's coming up in the message. But we're, once again this week, we're doing something a little special, a little different. And first, I'd like to invite all the current consistory members um, and any others who may be serving on a committee at the church to come forward. Um, just come down to the bottom of the steps if you can. And um, we have a little liturgy that should be in, in your bulletins that we're going to follow. It was too long to put on the screen, so you'll have to deal with... Uh, and I have extras if anybody up here needs them. <laughs> So gather all around the steps there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretend like you like each other. <laughs> okay. You guys need one of these two? Uh, I can't remember. I'm glad to Okay. <laughs> I know that feeling. <laughs> so this is a, a, a liturgy for installation of the servants. So every year when we elect new consistory members or new committee members, um, I think it's a good thing to recognize them and bless them in their journey. So if you'll just follow along, um, there'll be one part that the congregation will take part and the rest uh, I will do with the installation. So these people have been called by God in accordance with the faith and order of this church to serve among us. They've accepted their call and are before us in witness to their willingness to serve. So siblings in Christ, it's an honor to be entrusted with the responsibility for particular service in the ministry of the church. Having prayerfully considered the duties and responsibilities of your ministry, are you prepared to serve with the help of God in Christ's name for the glory of God? If so, please say, I am. I am. I am. Do you promise to exercise your ministry diligently and faithfully, showing forth the love of Christ? If so, please say, I do, relying on God's grace. I do, I do relying on God's, God's grace. Members of this household of faith, all of you out here, you have heard the promises of our siblings in Christ who have answered God's call to service. So let us affirm our, our intention to live in covenant with them. So will you rise in body or in spirit and witness to the commitment we now make? And then join with me in the prayer. We gather in celebration of the joy that is ours to be partners with you in the service of Christ. We promise to love you, honor your leadership, and assist you that together we may be a faithful church of Jesus Christ. You may be seated. And now let us pray. Eternal God, you have called these people to serve you in this household of faith and in the world which you have entrusted to our care and keeping. Send your Holy Spirit upon them, that they may serve among us with honor and faithfulness. Help them to be diligent in their duties, that your church may prosper in the mission you place before it. May their example prove worthy for all of us to follow, as we are united in Christ's ministry to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, and on the behalf of the people of St. John United Church of Christ, I, now, I rejoice to announce that you are now installed in your respective positions that you've actually been working in for three months. <laughs> you may all return to your seats.
Now it's the time in our worship service where we lift any special joys or concerns going on in our own lives or the lives we, those we love and care for, or just things going on in the world that we feel need to be lifted in prayer. I'll try to summarize each of those prayers and say, Lord, in your mercy, and ask that you respond, hear our prayer. So are there any special joys or concerns we can lift up this morning? I have a couple. Um, a friend of mine, Bruce uh, Grensmer, his wife Polly, after 27 years with solder, uh, her entire department was eliminated as part of a cost-cutting measure, and so now she's suddenly unemployed, and um, Bruce had surgery scheduled, and now he has to cancel it because of the loss of health care coverage. So prayers for Polly and Bruce, Lord, in your mercy. And for a friend of ours, is a young man who's fighting kidney failure that is caused or ha is caused by military assignments that he had while he served in the military. Lord, in your mercy. Sarah. So prayers for Sarah's brother who um, has been in hospice for nearly 12 weeks and they thought it would be like four to six weeks. And of course it's taking a toll on his wife and his family as they continue to care for him. So prayers for all those who care for those who are in hospice. Lord, in your mercy. So let's spend a few moments lifting these prayers that we have heard and gathering them together with those we still hold in the depths of our heart knowing that God hears our deepest concerns and our greatest joys, even when we struggle to bring them to our lips. Loving God, thank you for life, for all the people who bring joy to our lives, for all the people who make us angry, for all the people who disagree with, who, with whom we disagree, and for all the people who love us. Life is a wonderful mystery given as a gift for us to savor. Death is a strange mystery given to us as a gift which leads us into the next phase of eternal life. Facing our death, our own or another's, is difficult and something we would prefer to avoid if we could. Grief consumes us at times and makes it difficult to continue to live life to the full. Hear our prayers, Lord, for the people who are facing their own death today. For those people who are coming to terms with illness or facing long and difficult treatments or investigations or decisions, Lord, make, may they know your presence among them and within them. Hear our prayers, Lord, for the people who are already grieving the loss of a loved one. For those people caught up in the anger and despair that loss can bring. Lord, may they know your presence around them and within. Hear our prayers, Lord, for the people who care for those at the end of life in hospitals, hospices, and care homes, for the doctors and nurses, the health care assistants, the porters, the clerks, the family members. 
Lord, may they know your presence around them and within. Hear our prayers, Lord, for the people who care for people in their homes, for the staff who travel to their patients and provide a way for people to be at home. Lord, may they know your presence around them and within. Hear our prayers, Lord, for the people who live in places like the United States where there is no national health care system, where health care is often limited and end-of-life care virtually non-existent. Lord, may they know your presence around them and within. And hear our prayers, Lord, for the people who are forced to provide care for themselves, for their loved ones, who struggle to cope with their own feelings and lack of experience. Lord, may they know your presence around them and within. And in your mercy, hear our prayers this day. Give us patience to await your answers and strength to be the answer when you ask it of us. All this we pray in the way that Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory now and forever. Amen. Well, every year, St. John United Church of Christ sends a portion of our offerings and um, offerings to the greater United Church of Christ through our church's wider mission, OCWM. And we actually include this in our budget rather than having a special offering for it. This fund helps um, to fund the work of the local association, the regional conference, and the national offices of the United Church of Christ. So your giving helps, um, your giving to St. John United Church of Christ extends far beyond the walls of this building. And so now at this time, if you're in the sanctuary, we invite you to prepare an envelope to leave in the collection plates at the entrance to the sanctuary. Or if you're at home, to drop in the mail. Or you can always connect with our online giving platform through the URL that's shown on the screen or by snapping on the QR code there, which will take you directly to that website. Without the breath of God, we are dry bones. And without the word of God, we are dust. So with gratitude, let us offer our lives to the Lord of all life.
invite you to raise your voices together with mine in the dedication of these gifts to God's work. Holy One, giver of all good gifts, you have given us an abundance of life and love in our lives. We are rich beyond compare in so many ways. Receive these gifts we bring today. May they be a sign of all that we offer and may they be used to bring your kingdom to earth today and always. Amen. Dear God, this is our prayer for illumination. O oh Lord, we wait for you, and in your word we trust. By the power of your spirit, set our hearts and our minds on the source of life and peace. Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The passage taken from John might be familiar to many of you. This is the story of Jesus' resurrection of the body of Lazarus, a very fitting passage as we approach the Easter season. Now a certain man, Lazarus of Bethany, was ill. 
He was from the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who had anointed the Lord with perfume and had wiped his feet with her hair. Mary's brother, Lazarus, was the one ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death, rather it is for God's glory, so that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, even after hearing that Lazarus was ill, Jesus stayed for two more days in the place where he was. Then after this time, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea once again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? But Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk in the day do not stumble because they see the light of the world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, Jesus told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about Lazarus' death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go also, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about the death of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even I, now I know God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again on the resurrection of the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Martha said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into this world. When Martha had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and he is calling for you. And when Mary heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were there with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the 
come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? The Holy Spirit breathes into these words. When I was <clears throat> serving in my seminary internship, the uh, supervising pastor and I developed a plan for my time at the church. And we talked a lot about the transition into ministry, which she understood since she was also a second career uh, pastor. And in writing our plan together, she asked me where, she, where I thought I needed to grow. And after thinking about it for a while, I told her that, well, I might need to confront death. Maybe it was related to my age, I would think it was 47 at the time, or maybe my upbringing, or maybe even just my nature, but in looking at the times that I had to deal with death, the, the death of my aunt, the death of Laurel's brother, and then the death of my brother's wife, I felt I really didn't handle it well. My emotions just overwhelmed me. So I said I needed to confront death. Sorry, somehow my thing shut off. So I needed to confront death. And she had just the situation for me. She asked me to counsel a young man from the congregation who was in his mid-30s and dying from brain cancer. I'll just call him Bob. And Bob had a young wife and two children. I think they were four and six at the time. Now in the verses from John leading up to today's scripture, we're told that after being threatened with stoning in Jerusalem, Jesus left there and began traveling around the area outside of Judea. And in our story, Jesus was at least a couple days' journey from the town of Bethany in Judea, where his friends Lazarus and Martha and Mary were living. Physical distance separated them. And when messengers arrived and told Jesus that his friend Lazarus was ill, Jesus did an interesting thing. He did not drop everything in the moment to go and be with Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. In fact, the text states, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place that he was. As my HarperCollins Study Bible indicates, as elsewhere in John, Jesus acts in his own time. Bob's wife was a nurse's aide who was going to school to become an RN. Hospice had set up a hospital bed in their house so she could provide most of his care under the supervision of a hospice unit. When I came to visit, she would leave us alone in the room to chat. Bob told me that he loved his wife and his kids more than life itself. He wanted nothing more than to get better. But he knew his cancer was terminal. But he didn't want to leave his family. He could not picture a life without them. He felt perhaps that he had unfinished business to, to attend to. And re in reflecting on my emotions during feedback sessions with my supervising pastor, I, I began to see how my issues with death may have been tied to my own sense of unfinished business. For as Soren Kierkegaard writes, the most painful state of being is remembering the future, particularly the one you cannot have. So we're told that Jesus lingered a couple more days before leaving on the trip to Bethany in Judea where Lazarus was living with Martha and Mary. And Jesus knew that it was dangerous to go back to that area since it was so near to Jerusalem where he had been nearly stoned. Jesus knew what would happen to him. He knew where the trip would lead. I mean, it's a story we know and recall on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. But Jesus went because he knew he had some unfinished business there that needed to be taken care of. 
When Martha heard Mary or heard Jesus was coming, she, she went out and met him. And Martha walked with Jesus and seemed to express her faith in his ability to heal the sick, proclaiming that if only he had been there, Lazarus would not have died. Then Martha ran to tell Mary that Jesus was near. So Mary came out to greet him. And when she left the house, everyone assumed she was going to the tomb to visit Lazarus' body. Since it was common practice in Jesus' time to stay home for the first seven days of mourning, except to go to the tomb to grieve. And even then, my study Bible indicates the mourning was not just tears, but wailing and lamentation for the dead person. And when Mary came out to greet Jesus, <clears throat> she knelt at his feet, weeping, perhaps even wailing and full of lamentations. And John writes, When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews that came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. God incarnate in Jesus Christ felt the pain of those mourning and was deeply moved. God feels our pain and weeps with us. When Jesus asked where they laid Lazarus, he re they responded, Lord, come and see. And the scripture says, Jesus began to weep. Jesus wept. Jesus felt the pain of the loss. Even despite knowing that Lazarus would rise again, Jesus wept. He wept perhaps because he had some unfinished business. He wept perhaps because he could feel the pain of Lazarus' family and friends and knew that they too had some unfinished business. Perhaps Jesus also wept because he knew that the unfinished business he had waiting for him in Jerusalem was still to come. Now the Gospel of John is unique from the Synoptic Gospels, and that the story of Gethsemane is absent. It's a story in Matthew, Mark, and Luke where Jesus leaves the disciples behind to, to keep watch while he goes to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives, just before being betrayed by Judas. And the Synoptic Gospels tell us that while in the Garden, Jesus was overcome with emotion and asked God, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. That's the story as told in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verse 42. Jesus knew what was to come. He knew the unfinished business that had yet to be played out. Yet he submitted himself to face what he knew must be faced. Now some scholars believe that the story of Lazarus in the Gospel of John, Jesus was dealing with with the same emotions and questions as in the story from the Synoptic Gospels when he threw himself to the ground in the Garden of Gethsemane. In both stories, Jesus knew what was ahead of him. In both stories, Jesus questioned himself, and he questioned God. The Reverend Fred Craddock writes about this text from John. Jesus is invited to identify with us all struggling to live in faithful obedience under conditions of suffering and death. He is called to seek no exemption from disappointment, shame, betrayal, and misunderstanding. And then Craddock goes on. Jesus was greatly disturbed and wept. For the invitation to come under the same condition as his followers reminded him of what he knew when he first received the word of Lazarus's illness. This sickness is not unto death. The Son of God will go to the cross and to God because of it. Briefly put, Craddock says, for Jesus to call Lazarus out of the tomb is for him to enter it. Briefly put, our text is John's account of Jesus' Gethsemane. Jesus wept for the unfinished business he had yet to face. Just a couple weeks before Bob died, I went to visit him. And when I walked into his room, I asked him how he was doing. 
And he replied, well, ma'am, I'm dying. He had finally come to, uh, to terms with his death, though he still wasn't very happy about it. And I asked him if I could do anything for him, and he asked if I could just massage his back and his shoulders. So I had him lean forward, and I massaged his back and his shoulders in his gaunt frame. Thanks, he said. That feels great. In an article I read in Christian Century, Frederick Streets writes, So much is stimulated in us when we face death. We search for answers that are beyond us. Weeping, suffering, and death are present in the text of some of life's facts. Jesus embodies hope in the presence of death, and a hope that persists after the death of those whom we love and care about. On the night before Bob died, I went to visit him again, and of course I had no idea at that time that he was going to die that night. But I knew it was close, since he had been in a coma for a few days, and hospice was there and fully engaged. His wife left me alone in the room again with him, as she had always done. Bob's breathing was slow and steady, and I talked to him for a while, reassuring him that everything was going to be okay. I told him that his wife and children loved him deeply and that he did not need to worry about them because there were a lot of people who were ready to take care of them. I, and I assured him, I assured him that it was okay for him to go. That someone else would take care of his unfinished business. So I kissed him on the forehead and said goodbye. And I left the room to go talk to his wife, and she was doing incredibly well. But she was ready for his suffering to end. And my own tears flowed as I drove home. And I got a call the next day that Bob passed in the night. By the time Jesus got to Bethany, Lazarus had already been dead four days. And scholars believe the gospel is specific about this, since it was an ancient Jewish belief that the soul left the body after four days. This is important to understand, because it means that if Jesus arrived on the fourth day, there would be no doubt that Lazarus was truly dead, because he would have been without his soul. When Jesus commanded the people to roll away the stone, Martha was concerned. Because, well, after four days of being dead, decay would certainly have begun and there would have been quite an order, odor from the lifeless, unembalmed body. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And then Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed to God in thanks for having heard him saying that he knew that God always heard him. Jesus gave thanks because God always hears us. God always hears our pain and lamentation. God weeps with us. But in Christ, we see the glory of God. In Jesus' resurrection, we have pain in the midst, we have hope in the midst of our pain. And it's the hope we find in the empty tomb on Easter morning. I want you all to understand that this hope we have in the glory of God through Jesus Christ does not mean that we have no cause to grieve or that we shouldn't grieve. It does not mean that we are weak or faithless if we wail, if we shout angry words at God, if we question God. Jesus questioned God. Jesus wept. God's shoulders are big enough to handle our anger and our pain. Because it's all part of working through the unfinished business. And God understands that. Well, I grieve for the loss of Bob. 
and the family actually let me speak at his funeral. But in witnessing his confrontation with death and in the power and strength of his wife who supported and cared for him, I was filled with hope. She remarried a few years later and had another child. And yet in the years following his death, she often shared with me what her Bob meant to her and the continuing importance of his family's life in her extended family's life. My life is blessed with having made this journey with the two of them, the four of them, actually. And my relationship with death today is far different. And yet I still weep. Sometimes Lent can seem to be a dark and grim time with all the focus on sin and repentance. But it is part of the journey. A journey we must take the time to make so that we can appreciate the hope of Easter morning. When we're dealing with grief, we take each day as it comes, holding on to hope, hope that comes from remembering a future we cannot have with the knowledge of faith for a future that we have been assured is ours through God's love in Jesus the Christ. There may be unfinished business to take care of, but in the end, we are all welcomed home by God. And you find the courage to share your grief openly, just as Jesus did. May you be surrounded by those who give your life meaning. And may you know that the love of God never ends not in this life or the next. Amen. Sometimes technology works, sometimes it doesn't. So now I invite you to join together with me in praying the prayer that's shown on the screen. God, we hear the phrase, good life, good death, good grief. But do we really understand it or choose to live it? When you gave humanity life, you said it was very good. Life is a gift to be lived fully, to be enjoyed and savored. Part of living is dying, dying to self and dying to allow a new life to begin. Jesus showed us that death is not the end. Why do we struggle to believe it? Part of living is losing loved ones, grieving for them, and traveling on without them, forever holding them in our hearts, and glad to have had them in our lives. Lord, help us to hear these words once again and to live them. Good life, good death, good grief. Remind us that you are with us in all of life, in death and in grief. Amen.
Jesus wept for his friend and called him back to the world. We, like Lazarus, hear Jesus calling us friend. We, like Lazarus, are reborn by his love. As we leave this place, God goes with us, inspiring and reinvigorating our life. Our worship has ended, and our service begins.